add this to this add to this rich array of headline the fact that today's world, your world, is just smaller. How are we going to make sense out of what William James called this buzzing, booming confusion? Many people have argued that America has lost its moral compass, that we have what amounts to an ethics crisis in our society. And this is not an argument which is confined uh, to the United States. They claim that we've become or in danger of becoming a society that's self-centered, uh, and you especially are self-centered, uh, I'm told, uh, inward focused and uncaring about the plight of the rest of the world. Well, I'm not certain about the language of crisis. Uh, who in my generation can forget the energy crisis as the moral equivalent of war? Uh, or the drug crisis, or maybe it was even the drug war, I don't remember. Uh, what I'm certain of is that there are plenty of ethical and moral challenges in our society. And most of the analyses that have been offered for this contain, at best, only a partial truth. So I conducted an experiment. I looked at the headlines, yahoo.com, for one day today. And I concentrated mostly on things in the U.S. I didn't go to the global part. I didn't have to. And I'd like to suggest that this set of headlines, each of them contains what I would call an ethics issue. So I'm going to read a few of these until we all get tired of this. Uh, Mitt Romney at CPAC. What's the ethics issue? What does it mean to be a conservative? What do you stand for as a, as a conservative? I'm reading this as issues not to endorse any of them, but simply to make the point that there's ethics issues all over the place. Rioters clash with Greek police at Athens protest. Socrates would recognize the question of civil disobedience. Sandusky in court seeking to see grandkids. I tried to figure out what the issue of there was, and it was just too complicated. So I, I just said, <laughs> there's a bunch of stuff that's in that. Obama raises cash at gay couples' home. Teacher in L.A. sex abuse case, free on bail. Representative Bacchus focuses on insider trading probe. And they think the <coughs> Congress can uh, have insider trading, but we can't. Uh, Russian officer convicted of spying for the CIA. What does it mean, what does it mean to, to spy in one's country? Is polygamous leader preparing his flock for doomsday? Uh, again, there's a lot in that headline. <laughs> Nearly 1 in 20 U.S. adults over 50 have fake needs. What's the ethics issue in that? Well, what's health care? What's the cost of health care? What duties do I owe to myself to take care of my own body? Um, police strike in Rio bringing fears for Carnival. No one should be afraid of Carnival. Uh, December trade gap widens. Brazil Jets deal heats up as Boeing freezes bid. Leon Del Bessel results miss Wall Street share slump. What's the moral obligation that you have to, to meet uh, Wall Street's expectations? South Africa's Malima presses for nationalization. Facebook's pre-IPO rush to make money off of you. Russian Daily accuses Putin group of cyber attack. Brazil files injunction against Twitter. That seemed a category mistake. Twitter's a company, Brazil's a country. Uh, NASA might build a deep space outpost near the moon. Uh, Mary J. Bly rocks uh, at concert for charity. Penguin halts ebook sales to library. Teenage girl from Afghanistan to box at the Olympics. Nadal slams French TV puppet show's drugs charge. I kind of wanted to see what that was, but I didn't <laughs> Midwives make home births safer for babies. Scientists say NASA cutting missions to Mars. 2C warming goal now optimistic. Komen charity under microscope for funding. Diet soda linked to heart disease risk. Alzheimer's disease symptoms here I've been helped. Reversed in mice. Obama to try and placate Catholics on contraceptives. Gonorrhea could join a growing list of untreatable diseases. French weight loss drug killed at least 1,300. And here's some news. Pop use could double the risk of car crash. Very slow speeds, but nonetheless. <laughs> Russia alarmed by a rash of teenage suicides. And my favorite, China probes bouncing boiled eggs. <laughs> Evidently there are some eggs and you boil them and they bounce. And that's like a problem. 
<laughs> That's just, I got tired after those for a while. That's just today. Now you might argue that some of these issues here aren't ethical, but I'd urge you to take a broader view of what ethics is. If you see ethics as how do decisions that you and I make affect each other, uh, and then you can make the case that most of these issues have something to do with ethics. My point is pretty simple. How can anyone make sense of all this? The issues come from so many different directions, they're not necessarily connected. And you begin to think about what it would mean to have a carefully thought through view on each of these issues. Jefferson's world was complex, but it wasn't this complex. And as we know, it was difficult for people in Jefferson's day to have comprehensive and consistent views about what's ethical and what's not. Let's leave aside the idea that if that's what we expect from our politicians and our leaders, to be able to deal with this incredible uh, panoply of ethical issues, no wonder the system is broken. Let's just focus, for instance, on how we raise our children. It's simply overwhelming to think that I have to be able to think through health care, business and trade, space exploration, corruption, birth control, along with a host of other issues. And let's not forget the usual stuff of how we treat our friends and strangers. In a very technologically sophisticated world, with normal stuff hasn't gotten any easier, as Facebook and Google prove every day. There are at least four, what I want to suggest, are partial or incomplete stories about how to understand these phenomena. First story says, well, look, the world's changed a lot. You know, you're not in Kansas anymore, or I'm not in 1950s Georgia anymore. The world's just complicated. And that's right. Today's world highlights ethical conflict simply because we're more aware than ever about other cultures and different ways of living. So do we have to get more accustomed to a different world? But the question is still, how do we do that? What do we do? We need a dialogue that at least takes these cultural and ethical differences into account. So if, if it's right, the world's smaller, it's, it's, uh, things are more complicated, the answer is then we better amp up our dialogue about how cultural and ethical differences come into account. Secondly, some people have argued, mostly philosophers here, that we need a more comprehensive conception of our ethics. We need to see whether our ethical principles can maintain us in such a world. Again, how we do this is what's most important. Simply applying tried and true principles doesn't always work. One of my favorite movies is Mel Brooks' History of the World, Part 1. <laughs> Mel Brooks comes down from the mountain with three tablets. I bring you the 15, drops one, 10 commandments. Right? We're missing at least five. To illustrate, we've got a clear idea and a clear principle about property. Property is my stuff. It's my stuff. I got it. You don't. It's mine. Except that in the digital world, uh, that's hard to apply. In a digital world, I can have something, you can have it, and neither of us are diminished. The very idea of property as stuff, as stuff, which goes back uh, certainly uh, to Locke in the Western tradition and even further in other traditions, is an idea that uh, we can't really understand uh, very well these days. And when we try to make it work, we end up with things, ideas like intellectual property about which uh, you know, there's huge controversy, etc. And we do need better ethical reasoning. I'm not arguing that we don't. It's what we teach. Uh, it may turn out that different societies have different comprehensive conceptions of uh, ethics, even as a philosopher like Rawls would acknowledge. We already have enough differences in religions. We don't need any more. What we need is, again, surprise, a dialogue within and among these different conceptions of ethics. 
So yes, we have more, we, we, we need more comprehensive conceptions, but that tells us we need more conversation, uh, not less. Third, some people have argued that we need a return to the idea of a civic space where we can come to reason together about our issues and our future. Indeed, I think this very society is founded on the idea that there is a civic space where if we can reason about our issues uh, and listen to each other, we can find some common ground. However, perhaps the exception of the Jefferson Society, most of what we've seen is frankly artificially constructed meetings by some elite group of politicians or academics who simply have an axe to grind. There's again some truth here in this explanation. We do have to create some new ways to have dialogue together. And we do need to reclaim civic space for dialogue, but dialogue that can make a difference. The hopeful part of what I have to say is in part here, because I believe the technology offers us a way to create a civic space uh, that really is democratic. Um, we don't know how to do that yet. There are lots of experiments going on. And out of those experiments, I hope, uh, we'll find some pretty interesting things. Finally, people have said what we really need is moral leadership. Whenever there's a crisis, an ethics crisis, people argue, hey, we need more integrity. We need more moral leadership. And, and look, this is surely right. But I'm not willing to leave the very fabric of what we stand for up to our leaders, especially our political leaders. One of the great things about the new world we live in is that leadership can come from many places. But more to the point, how are our leaders to make sense of the same phenomenon? I know a great number of business leaders that I admire, but they struggle as much as I do with trying to make sense of the world in which they find themselves in every day. In other words, we need more moral leadership, true, but who do we follow? So I want to make a different suggestion tonight. It's not that these four things aren't surely right and we need more. But I believe we need a dialogue, a conversation, that cuts across generations, societies, north and south, east and west, classes, races, religions, and other contingencies of life. This dialogue must put ethics and ethics issues on center stage. In short, I want to suggest we need to remoralize our conversations about what it means to live a good life and create good communities. I want to be careful because, uh, first of all, I want to say when I say ethics or when I say morals, I'm using those interchangeably because unfortunately I have 400 philosophy courses and I can't talk to you. Ethics and morals are about how we are going to live our life how I'm going to live my life, and it's how we're going to live our lives. There's always an individual part, there's always a social part. But I want to be as clear as possible about what this remoralization means, because I think there's some dangerous, uh, dangerously bad turns you could take uh, along this. Remoralizing our dialogue means, I think, articulating some principles for each of our institutions that help us discover and create or recreate their purpose. One of the things I love about this university is I think its principles are very clear. How we bring them to life in everything that we do, I believe we have substantial work to do on that. It's not as if Jefferson started it and we can let it lie. We have to continually bring alive what the principles uh, of inquiry and community uh, mean in today's world. So the first thing we need to do is articulate principles for each of the institutions that we have to help us discover and create or recreate their purposes. We need to craft an ongoing conversation about these principles and purposes. That's a lot. I spend a lot of my time with businesses. You can walk into uh, a company like uh, Whole Foods and you can literally smell the values. Uh, I don't mean in the food. Oh, that's a great joke. Uh, you can literally, you know they mean what they, what they say they stand for. All you have to do is listen to the boys talk to each other. All you have to do is go to the store and pay, and pay attention. Many companies have principles, but they don't mean them. Many universities have principles, but they don't mean them. 
So figuring out how we create principles and how we bring the conversation to life is a rather, fairly substantial challenge. I think this works only if we adopt a kind of Deweyan mindset of experimentalism around these principles and purposes, rather than a thing that says, I know exactly what this means all the time. In today's world, I think that's not true. We need to routinely expect such a conversation from our leaders, I think especially our political leaders, though I don't have much hope. Uh, we need to be teaching our citizens, children, and adults how to have better conversations about the stuff that matters to us. And we need to orient our institutions around building hope and freedom rather than only building, in our case, careers. Word of caution is an order. Remoralizing has nothing to do with a return to fundamentalism. And fundamentalism refers to an unthinking and uncritical application of solutions that may have worked in the past, or a nostalgic we believe to have worked in the past. I believe that is in part what's gotten us into the mess we're in. And such fundamentalism comes in all sizes. Such fundamentalists can be Christian, Muslim, Hindu, liberal, conservative, college professors, politicians, <coughs> factory workers, or anybody else who doesn't want dialogue, who believes that they can't learn from others. I do have respect for almost all views of people. There are limits, if I'm honest with myself. But you and I need to be committed to spending time and energy in dialogue with those who share our concerns about our global society and who want to engage in a process of generating solutions who are committed to learning from each other. So I'd like you to think along with me for a few minutes about exercising what my uh, colleague, Professor Emeritus Patricia Wernhain calls our moral imagination. Our ability to create a more ethical world is limited by the stories that we can tell. It's limited only, really, by our imagination. So I invite you to think along with me as I pose a few questions. I'm not suggesting that these questions contain answers to all of our problems. They do contain some suggestions that are rarely a part of the dialogue we need. So you might find these questions somewhat strange. <clears throat> the general idea is what would our world be like if so I'm going to start with, what would our political institutions be like all over the world if governments didn't use their coercive power? What would our political institutions all over the world be like if we had a commonwealth of nations tied together by value creation and trade? What would our political institutions be like if people could move freely among borders? Is that given an Indian company said to me once, you know, uh, globalization is a natural order of things. We've only had passport and borders for about 200 years. <laughs> what would our political institutions be like all over the world if there were relatively low tax rates? If we turned the war on drugs into a war on ignorance? If all political offices for the next 100 years had to be held by women? What would our political institutions be like if generals had to be mothers? What would they be like if politicians stopped trying to tear each other down? What would, what would our institutions be like if people actually vote? What would our businesses be like if businesses saw themselves as part of communities dedicated to improving those communities? What would our businesses be like if executives, indeed all employees, saw their job as how to create value for stakeholders, customers, suppliers, employees, communities, and shareholders? How to make them better off? What would our businesses be like if businesses were as clear and transparent as possible about what they stood for regardless of what that was? If executives understood the effects of their own theories about what make people tick. What would our businesses be like if business enabled employees to engage in self-creation and the search for being authentic? 
if workplaces smelled like communities that people wanted to live in, what would our businesses be like if people believed Muhammad Yunus that poverty belongs in a museum? What would our schools and universities be like if each school had a clear and committed purpose? If education was a lifelong pursuit? If anyone could go to a school at any time of their life? If anyone could offer a course for others at schools? If schools were open 24 7, 3, 6, 5? If schools were technologically sophisticated? If schools did not depend on geographical place, if attendance in uh, Emerson High School was not compulsory, what would our schools be like if you get committed to learning or you leave? What would our schools be like if there was childcare that wasn't mixed up in the school system? What would our schools be like if we took the competition with others out and we built in competition with ourselves to get better and learn more? What would our schools be like if values such as courtesy, integrity, perseverance, and responsibility had absolutely the center stage? If we valued our teachers as much as we do our sports heroes and rock stars? And if we concentrated on inspiring people to learn and to be responsible for their own learning. What would science and technology be like if we saw ourselves as pioneers that had to explore both our world and the next one for our children? If we could invent cool stuff that made the environment better, helped people live better, and made money? What would science and technology be like if we could put exploring human knowledge on the same level of importance as a war on terrorism or the war on drugs. If everyone had a connection to each other, to all of human knowledge, to all of human history, and it sat on your desktop for roughly less than $100 a year. What would science and technology be like if we came to see both literature and science as two roughly equal ways of trying to live better lives and create better communities? What would our religious institutions be like if all religions renounced violence? If all religious leaders simply signed a document denouncing, categorically with no exceptions, the use of violence in pursuing any religious goal or life? What if politicians signed a similar document? What would our religious institutions be like if each religion acknowledged the others and their legitimacy? The time is right to raise the standard for our public dialogue in all our institutions. We need to put ethics, values, and principles in the center stage, yet have an open dialogue that avoids righteous moralizing. We need to apply what I've come to call the Benjamin and Molly rule. They are the names of my three children. The rule goes like this at the end of the day, and I go home and say to Ben, Emma, and Molly, or whoever you uh, want to put in there, any of you don't have children. Let me tell you what I did today. Let me tell you what I did today that I'm proud of, that I want you to learn from. So we aren't trying to make our institutions places for our children to live in, places for our loved ones to be, then honestly, we've set the bar too low. We need to remake the world and remake it for the better. Our future depends on it. Thank you very much.
their favorites, but uh, you know the truth is, uh, I, if I only if if if, if, the, if the aliens came down and said pick one, or we're going to get rid of all of you. <laughs> I had to pick one of these. Okay, so turn that to one of the I'm pretty sure I know that. All the politicians are women. Is it is it pretty much coincidence? that political leaders have, for the most part, the history of it. I don't, and that the world's kind of messed up. I, I don't know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I mean, give, give, give them a chance. <laughs> you know, well, what, what's going to happen? Are you going to screw up the world more? <laughs> Speech. I'm just wondering, some of the things that you uh, discuss, uh, the sort of dialogue that you talk about, is very much based on you know, sort of reasoned discourse and sort of rationalized discussion. Uh, and you did allude to briefly religious, uh, religious beliefs, things that are taken more on belief. I wonder if there is room for, for premises that are accepted solely on belief in this sort of dialogue that you, decide, that you talk about. Sure. So the way I would think, I have two answers to your question. It's a very good question. The first is, of course, uh, we know from the work of people like uh, John Haight and others that you know reason doesn't always cut it. So if you think about it as I think their view as the rider, the elephant, the path. If you know that thing, sometimes it's the it's the study that says uh, I give you uh, I, I, I give you bad popcorn, and if I give it to you in a bigger tub, you eat more. Right? Even though you think you don't. So the way choices get presented, reason doesn't always overcome those things. But we can have some dialogue about those things. We can have dialogue about how we design institutions so that we're more likely to get ethically acceptable outcomes. We can take that behavioral research that we know uh, and think about that. For instance, in business, I mean, one thing we know is that if-then incentives, if you do this, then you'll get this, uh, actually make performance worse. Now, most every business I know has if-then incentives, and it just ignores that behavior. I focus people so much on the if-then that they do things that are unethical. <coughs> to get that. Rather than focus them on purpose, on the fact that they're trying to master something themselves, and then give them some autonomy. Right? So there are all kinds of things that we can do, that, so this doesn't depend on this sort of, uh, you know, life of pure reason, uh, which, uh, which is there, and I, I think that's important. It has to start, though, with saying, look, uh, the way uh, Rawls would say this is, you have your private beliefs, however, whatever they are, for whatever reason. Uh, let's assume that uh, you're... Uh, an evangelical Christian for a minute. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. Uh, and let's assume that I, on the other hand, am a worms and dust Darwinist. So worms and dust, that's it. Yeah. And we're, we're trying to have some dialogue. If you give me evangelical Christian re reasons, I'm not going to hear it. And if I give you worms and dust Darwin reasons, you're not going to hear it. So what we got to find is a public space. But we got to find the stuff that we can agree on and work out from there. There's an idea that ethics is fundamentally about you got yours, I got mine. That's individualism. Right? But it turns out, if you ask people as I have all over the world, name their top three values, it turns out to be a remarkable degree of similarity. 
So how do we find what we can agree on for whatever reason that turns out to be and have some conversation about that versus I try and convert you and you try and convert me. That ultimately spirals its way to violence. So I think that's a good question. It's not, it can't be just about reason. There are some hands over here. I promise to have shorter answers. Yeah. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for coming here tonight again. Um, so you mentioned that increased communication among us and uh, among different cultures has led to more uh, ethical issues. How, but then you mentioned that increased dialogue would help ameliorate these issues. How so? Well, I, look, you have two choices. Uh, one is you can disagree and uh, you, you can fight about it. Winner gets their ideas. Or you disagree, you can talk about it and try to find a way that both of you can flourish. I'm clearly in the disagree, talk about it, uh, try to find some way you can both flourish. It's hard to do, right? It's very hard, it's very hard, hard to do. Now we don't need to look at different cultures. We can look within any society and we find the same kind of stratification. Uh, of a kind of lack of dialogue, a lack of sophisticated uh, 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 ethical conversation. Part of that, part of that might come from our individualism. You get to make your call. You know, look, you got to live with yourself. Unfortunately, I got to live with you too. Right? We all do. And so, how we do that? We, I'm suggesting we need to get better at that. I don't have any magic for it, but we need to get better at it. And this is especially true for all of you. Because your world's small, you know, your your world's small, uh, and you're you're confronted daily, if you think about it, with a whole bunch of ethics issues that are very hard to put together. And it's easier just to say, "Screw it, I'm not going to do it. I'll just do what I want to do," and that ultimately uh, doesn't bode very well for the world. I think in a way, that's what our political system. Good question. Thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Um, my question has to do with uh, kind of the biology of, of ethics. You know, um, over the last 50 years or so, violence has shown a number of different organisms, basically all vertebrates and higher organisms that you know, treat like selfishness, nepotism, uh, these are hardwired into our DNA. Mm -hmm. How do you think? Apply social discourse in such a way that you can change humans to be something that they're fundamentally. Uh, yeah. Well, I disagree with you about the biology. Uh, they have also shown that cooperation uh, and working together is one of the most evolutionarily stable uh, things that, that have happened for a long time. Uh, Daniel Dennett has a wonderful argument about what a what a what a great trick ethics is. Uh, and so I, I'm gonna. And you probably know more about the biology than I do. I, I kind of read a lot about how important cooperation uh, turns out to be. So I don't think those things uh, are hardwired. I think the idea of hardwired uh, is itself philosophically problematic. Uh, what we know is uh, human beings are uh, pretty incredible. That some things might be hardwired, but we can change some of the wiring. So it's a longer conversation. I'm not going to accept the premise that that's the only way it is. Certainly that's a part of it. Human beings are complicated. And so what I'm distrustful of is when business people say, well, you know, got to be self-interested. Human beings are self-interested the way they are. Really? Have you not been paying attention? Do you not have children? If you have children, you are not completely self-interested. You know, I mean, you're just not. You're a horrible parent. <laughs> uh, and so, this, it has to be complete self-interest. That's my objective. Not that we aren't self-interested. Of course we are. But we do incredible acts for others as well. We are complicated. And to try to reduce us to pure self-interest creatures is to make what Dennett would call the greedy reductionist move. Uh, there are good reasons for existing. Uh, if, you, if you haven't read it, I was saying to someone earlier tonight, uh, Dennett's book uh, called Darwin's Dangerous Idea is a really brilliant book that Dennett understands 
not only the neuroscience, but he understands evolutionary theory in this issue. Now, he's not uncontroversial. So, I, and I need to know more. It's hard. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm getting that everybody says that now. <laughs> 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 Um, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, teaching business ethics and management. Um, so, and, and I'm asking you to help me. So, as somebody who has to teach business ethics at UVA, I do get the occasional for coaches student. I mean, actually, I see some of them here tonight. I see Andy Young, I see Russell, I see Kevin Hujanowski. Uh, and the precocious student will ask questions like, "Can leadership actually be taught?" I don't right. mind. Right. I know that. Leadership to catch it, but can it actually be taught? And if so, and it's kind of a Plato question. What would be the ingredients of that curriculum? What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Well, that's a good question. Uh, full disclosure: uh, Harper was the best MBA ethics student I ever had. So. <laughs> Leaders emerge out of that. 
What's my curriculum? You know that as well as I do. Uh, it's Plato. It's Confucius. It's uh, the sacred text in Hindu. It's uh, Montaigne. It's Jefferson. It's the humanities. It's, uh, it's Dewey. It's also science. It's also trying you today, you can't live in the world if you don't know something about biology. If you don't, I know too little, but if you don't know something about biology, if you don't know something about how science works. Right? So it is that classical liberal education. The last place I look, and I teach this, so I better be careful. The last place I look to teach leadership would be in leadership courses in business schools. Now, I teach a leader, unless you're teaching leadership using the creative arts. You teach the complexity of human beings and human behavior by using art and music and drama and literature. Then if you have people reflecting on what does it mean to lead a business, and they're trying to put something together on stage, or they're trying to play music together, or they're trying to create something that's never been done, then I think you're more liable to the So I don't, I don't know if you disagree here. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for coming um, tonight. Um, my question is, you from you know all of your thought experiments, it seems like a lot of the, um, the answers to those might be things that we would love to implement if the world was a blank slate and we had you know there was we could just write it. But the problem is we have to get there from here, right. which is quite different. So I was just wondering if you had any ideas or um, anything that you envisioned of you know way to, changes that could be made to um, make our society more ethical or get to some of those. Vote for a winner. <laughs> for starters, I mean, look, there are a lot of things you can do. Start a school. Right? You change, change doesn't, it, it, the world doesn't change by, you know, I've got the pixie dust and I throw it somewhere. You know, that's which is what you're saying. So you got to pick somewhere to start. you got to pick somewhere that you have absolute fire in the belly about. That you, you've got to do this whether it's start a school, whether it's start a business, uh, whatever that turns out to be, and you got to do it. And I think you got to do it now. You know, the, the, the waiting around stuff, you lose the fire. So try to, trying to think about your own purpose, what you have passion to do. There are a lot of places you can start, and I don't have any grand vision here. You know, some of the things I've talked about have been ideas on the left, some of them ideas on the right, some of them ideas in the center, some of them ideas off the wall. Whatever those turn out to be, you got to figure out how you want to figure, you know, how you're going to make the world better because it's something you got to do. You got to do it for yourself and you got to do it for the people that you care about. No substitute for that. I think you're absolutely right. You can't. I, I'm, I, that's why the political season is so just incredibly impressive to me. Uh, because they don't realize it. You just say stuff, you don't have to do anything. But if, you, if you just say stuff and don't do anything, don't say it. Because you're just in bad faith. Yes? Again, thank you for your speech. Um, I do have a question in terms of the dialectic between theory and hope. I do have a question about yes. the dynamic between theory and normative practice. Yeah. So I kind of a bit of a follow-up on Hunter's question in terms of where do you start and to, to follow up with that, how do you sustain it? If there's institutionalization and bureaucratization, these come at the cost of the very reasoning yeah. which began these reforms yeah. which led to these yeah. institutionalizations and yeah. bureaucratization. So in that sense, um, I did kind of have questions about that and also we skimmed the internet as a source for that democratic dialogue that seemed to be at the at, at the root of what your theories on ethics and leadership were. Um, could you say more about that? Yeah, uh, good, good, good question. The first thing I would say is uh, I think it's actually important, and I'm really prone to doing this, and I may have done it tonight. It's really important not to overthink this. 
You know, there are, if, if you want to list some reasons that you can't be successful, you won't be. I learned uh, my, my son and I are starting to record label. And uh, I learned from a guy who's built a very successful business. I was saying, it's just like, well, you know, we're going to start this, but who knows if we'll ever make a nickel in it. And, and he said to me, don't say that. You start something, you're going to make it successful. And you know what? He's right. I can see the difference in both, in both of us. I don't think it matters much where you start. Yeah, there's bureaucratization, there's, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. But if you don't start and do something, I know what the answer is. So I, 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 I think it's important not to try to look for the reasons stuff's going to fail. It's a different attitude. I, I walk into the studio every day now, not with a, oh gee, where's the next nickel coming from? I'm worried about that, but uh, I don't, uh, we're going to make this successful. And that's what you have to do. That really matters. And the second part of your question was about the internet. And I just hope, I mean, look, when, when you see what's happened in the world from uh, the end of the, you know what the, the, the main press uh, uh, wire is called in the Soviet, in the, in the Russia today? Interfax. The fax machine, in part, brought you the fall of the Iron Curtain because you couldn't keep information out, etc. Right? The fax machine and the technology brought you a more open and democratic China. More open, I didn't say completely, but more. I don't need to tell you what happened last spring and what continues to happen around the world. So I'm hopeful for the technology. You know, I gotta find hope <coughs> somewhere. Uh, and I'm hopeful, I've never seen more businesses and business students interested in starting something that both makes the world a better place and of course makes money. This idea of juxtaposing I get asked all the time, you know, ethics or can I have profits? And I, I think that's kind of like a question, you want a heart or a lung? You know, I'm reasonably partial to both of those things. Uh, you know, of course you've got to make money. You know, any business worth its salt has to, has to have profits. Just like, you know, I have to have red blood cells to live. But it doesn't follow that the purpose of my life is to make red blood cells. That would be foolish. And we've gotten that kind of badly wrong in, in business, it seems. And my hope is that we'll, that, that there is a lot of hope in the world. And it's through starting, through revising, through picking something we have passion about and doing, that there's hope. Yes? Thank you very much for speaking today. Um, you mentioned sort of how with education, the broad meaning of education, you mentioned how going through leadership years you take and Confucius and Jefferson and a wide range of sort of authors and sort of thinkers on this topic. Do you believe that the world as a community should start moving towards a globalized ethic as a whole and sort of compiling different ideas that work in different cultures and from the our cultures? Well, you know, there's a lot of stuff around the world that we actually do agree on. And there's a lot of stuff that we don't. What I'm, what I'm skeptical of is the this, this, this argument that comes after the one you just gave. So we need the state to enforce it. That I'm deep, I'm a libertarian, I'm deeply suspicious of that. Right? I'm, I'm deeply admirable of the human spirit and our ability to work together uh, to create value for, you, for each other in a whole bunch of dimensions. And we need more of that. We need more of that passion and spirit to do that. And less worrying that, gee, you know, uh, they, don't, they don't do things in Indonesia exactly the way we do in Charlottesville. Well, that's okay. I mean, there's, uh, in, in Indonesia's a wonderful place. Sometimes I gotta have conversations with my Indonesian friends about what we can agree on, because it rubs up against what's core to me or what's core to them. And we need to get better at having those. But I'm kind of 
in favor of um, as much diversity as you can get and have civil discourse and respect each other. Now, the problem is that only we have diversity is we all believe the same thing and kind of face the purpose. Yes. Thank you, again, sir, for your call. Um, I kind of like that. You start to feel the love soon. <laughs> I know that's the point, so that's good. From, from a fellow proponent of liberty, earlier you mentioned <laughs> something in your, your um, spree of questions. What would it be like if the state didn't use its coercive powers? What yes. do you think it would be like if the state didn't use its coercive powers? As much. Well, there's a there's a theory which you probably know called anarcho-capitalism and how that stuff works. And, uh, I mean, suppose people have suggested that maybe we could uh, figure out, we could choose what, what uh, government we pay our taxes to. Uh, and that they would offer us protection and all those sorts of things. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of literature uh, on that stuff. I meant that in a less theoretical way sense and just in the sense that if the first option wasn't always all right let's go screw somebody up you know or let's do something coercive or let's regulate if the first option was gee how can we create value so for instance i think one of the greatest uh and again i don't have any problem with the tobacco industry per person but i think one of the greatest things government most effectively ever did was it used the bully pulpit to get people to understand that uh, smoking is unhealthy. Uh, now, there's been coercion as part of it, too, but the information education campaign created a lot of value. How can we think about government as a value-creating institution? Uh, I think if we put our minds to that, we might find some pretty innovative stuff. Somebody has started to think about that. It's called NGOs, who are doing the work of government for the most part seeing themselves as value-creating institutions. So what happens in, uh, 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 in, in Ed's world here is uh, the gradual withering away of the state, uh, if you like. And what we have is a conversation. We have uh, an appreciation of the diversity of views represented by NGOs and others and others. And so the need for coercion is less. What worries me is uh, that's nice to say. There's a theory of practice gap right there. That's nice to say. In reality, that's not going to happen. So I'm willing to ask you, how can I be less coercive? How can I think about I can respect someone's dignity and liberty, have a conversation with them, uh, and not move as the first move to coerce? If we begin to do that, I think, for instance, that Relationships between men and women will be very different. Relationships between uh, uh, teachers and students, between the typical authority relationships, will look will, will begin to look different when we replace uh, coercion, which is there in a number of those in, in a number of those relationships. It's a wonderful novel written in the 1970s uh, called Etotopia, which if you uh, probably never read, does it? That's not a great novel, but uh, it's sort of a story about how this works. That's really that. Yes. Professor, thank you very much for talking to us this time. Um, my question is what do you think about ethical obligations towards the environment? And in particular, how do we go about reforming institutions such as business to yeah. reflect those obligations? So I wrote a book about uh, this some years ago uh, because I was walking down the hall, my son was pretty young. Walking down the hall, and I stepped on one of those little micro machine cars, you know, those metal with the sharp edges. I won't repeat what I said. But it was dark. And I said, Who turned off the adjective lights? And my son piped up with, We are saving the earth, Dad. And I said, Well, can we save the earth at the emergency room? You know, about that. well, I need to think about you know, what's gonna, you know, what I think about this. And I tried to write this book, and in the beginning, I was pretty pessimistic about this. At the end, I got to be pretty optimistic because there's so many companies out trying to do stuff that makes money, that's green, 
uh, they get the message and they're out doing that. So I, I actually feel pretty good about that. In terms of thinking about obligation to environment, and obligation to future generations, I think there's some problems with that language. People say all the time, oh, we have to save the planet. Truth is, and this may come as news, the planet's going to be fine. We're screwed, but the planet's going to be fine. We may not be here, but the planet will be here. You know, short of some cataclysmic nuclear thing. Uh, and so I think it's problematic. Uh, sometimes saying we have an obligation to the environment takes us away from we have the obligation to each other. And we have an obligation to each other's children to some extent to leave a world at least as good as we found it. And so I don't think you need obligation to environment. I don't think you need obligation to future generations. You might need obligation to children or children's children. You can hold that in their mind. The problem with future generations is uh, uh, what philosophers would call a Parfit problem after a very smart philosopher named Derek Parfit, uh, who argued that the actions you take today determine which future generations exist tomorrow. So when you say action to future generations, which ones? Do I have less of an obligation to the future generation in which China doesn't have a one-child policy? Or not. So it's a, it's a hopeless quagmire to try to sort that out. I don't think you need it. I think you have to say, look, we haven't lived in a way that's very respectful uh, of each other's living space. And we need to do that. We want to leave a world for our children. And we want to leave a world, I, I need to think about leaving a world for your children, children. And the way to do that, and not trade our microwaves for toaster ovens and don't live in the woods and eat nuts and berries and cavort and bears, is it seems to me we have to think about business as how do you be green uh, and how do you make money. The good news is that's going on, gangbusters, from big companies to small companies. I'll give you an example. I listened to a guy some years ago now, they've been doing it for a long time, who ran a small chemical company in Delaware named DuPont. And he was talking about uh, DuPont, the dirtiest company on earth. And he really wanted to change that. I mean, he genuinely wanted to change it. And so he announces for zero pollution, they put a, a pollution thing in place, and it's going to take a generation. DuPont's still working on this in 15 years. They're still work working, but they made enormous strides. He's one of the leaders. He's going around to all the uh, places, making the speech. You know, the the CEO comes around, makes the the damn it, I really mean it speech. You know, kind of thing. And uh, he goes to this one uh, place and he makes a speech, and he says, and the, and the engineers come up to him and they say, I'm sorry, Mr. Warlord, guy, guy's name was, was Ed Warlord. He said, uh, we, we can't meet this, these new interim steps. You know, they're zero pollution, but all kinds of interim, you know, goals and stuff. We can't meet these interim goals. This, this plant equipment's too old. This process is too dirty. We will never meet this. And Willard said, okay. You know, we're going to have to close the plant. Because, you know, we're serious about this. Environment, jobs, trade-offs, environment wins, jobs wins. Goes around. He says, engineers come back about a month later, and they say, well, you know, actually, miracle. <laughs> we figured out how to do it. And Willard, as he, I heard him tell the story, he said, uh, so what's going to cost? He's thinking $25, $30 million a big company, a big plant. And they said, well, actually, we we're embarrassed to say if we do it this new way, we're going to save money. That is human ingenuity. That's their creative spirit. And that's what we need more of. Not less of Now, the creative spirit also gives us uh, uh, these fake mortgages. Right? So there are downsides to that, too. Other, any other questions? I just wanted to know what are your thoughts, um, what kind of system block can we place on it, especially in formative years, such as early education and even parents, and how, how we can really make a change individually. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure.
sure that's the problem. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I taught at Head Start when I was uh, uh, in college. And uh, I was a teacher named Head Start. There were many men who did, did that. Uh, and then I had to go sell shoes at Kmart because they weren't paying us. It led to a whole different thing. Uh, but uh, I'd see these uh, kids from pretty economically poor uh, homes, and they were great kids. They, they didn't have problems knowing the kind of basics of ethics for five-year-olds. You know, they, they really didn't have a problem. Uh, I think what happens is, in the U.S. at least, in schools, we get less and less creative. Uh, you can, it's been demonstrated that if you ask a group of five-year-olds, who says, pull up a paper clip, you know, give me the number of uses uh, you can get for a pay, paper clip, they give you lots of uses. That number goes down as you, as you get through school to teenager. We lose our creativity. And that's what we need. And, uh, a wonderful book by Dan Pink called A Whole New Mind. Pink's a journalist, so this is a book you can actually read. Uh, he talks about uh, the need to figure out how to get people to be more creative, how to use the other side of our brain rather than the analytical side. Most of you got here because you're really good at the analytical parts of your brain. We have some creative art artists here, right? but it's majority overwhelming on the analytical side. Today's problems in business, I don't know about other institutions, in business, those aren't the problems. The problems are on the creative side. And I think we don't uh, train people for that. We don't encourage them to do it. And then we reward them in the wrong way through these narrow incentives. Dan Pink has a couple of wonderful 18-minute uh, TED, TED Talks. If you have heard. Other questions? Well, thank you very much for a very pleasant